Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I've been given the privilege and the honour this morning of preaching God's word. It may be a little challenging, so I'll just be pre-warned. Um, <laughs> so I hope you'll all be blessed by this. Um, shall we pray first? Yeah. Oh God, we ask, please help us today to hear your voice, Lord, and understand your word. Help me to deliver your word clearly by the power of your spirit. May our hearts be open to receive what you are saying to us this morning through your word. And may we remove every bit of distraction from our thoughts and focus on you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Well, the title of the sermon this morning, as you can see, is Are We Barabbas? A sermon with two titles. So, the reason why I've titled this sermon, Are We Barabbas? is, is because as I was writing this, I started to see myself as Barabbas. As we go on, you may even see yourselves as Barabbas also. So, let's see if the title changes towards the end. Hence, a sermon with two titles. So, as we've just heard uh, in the reading, it becomes noticeable that this is about the trial of Jesus Christ, or should I say, the illegal trial of Jesus, with the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, wanting to kill Jesus. They took him to Pilate, wanting to bring judgment on him. Being rejected by the common man, us, we also see criminals and murderers deserving of their punishment. A man named Barabbas with his fellow rebels who were arrested, awaiting their punishment. Further on, this passage actually leads us up to the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. But there's something else in this scripture that we can see. It actually reveals the heart of human nature. It proves that in its natural state is a totally depraved sinner, capable of so much hatred and evil, proving that in its natural state, people are actual enemies against God. We're not going to read this, but in Romans 8, 7 through to 21, it's basically a mirror for the human heart, fully re revealing its character and condition against God and without Christ. But before we continue, it's just a few pointers uh, to guide us through this. Number one, was all this God's plan? Did God, pl did God plan all this out from the beginning? Number two, was Jesus guilty? If he was guilty, what was he guilty of? Number three, why Jesus, not Barabbas? Why did not Barabbas go to the cross? And finally, if, if this is God's plan that we've read, what does it actually mean for us? So hopefully this should be revealed to us as we move along this morning. But if it's, if it's okay with you, I just want to share a story. Um, I'm not very good with stories, but I just want to share this um, to give you a bit of background on me and my wife uh, as to what we did when we first started uh, out as Christians. Um, I don't do this with any boast in my heart because without God in the centre of this, it wouldn't have even happened. So about 10 years ago, um, myself and my wife, Cathy, we hadn't been Christians long, maybe two years or so. Uh, we'd been asked by my wife's sister and her husband, um, Andy and Janet, if we wanted to join an outreach group. Now, I hadn't got a clue what an outreach group was. Um, to be honest, um, it wasn't a Christian group. It wasn't connected to a church at all. Uh, the few people who led it actually were atheists, um, but very nice people, really nice people. Um, I thought, well, that's a good start, isn't it? So, cut a long story short, we accepted, and before I knew it, we were out on the streets of Wolverhampton, uh, at the night time, pushing our makeshift trolleys around, carrying bags uh, of food, sandwiches, cakes. We had um, tents, sleeping bags, flasks of hot water, the same as what we use here, um, and blankets. Uh, pretty much anything that we could carry, and we looked a right stay, to be honest. Um, and this was to feed, and meet the needs of the homeless uh, who were on the streets. Uh, as we would be walking around giving out sandwiches, it gave us the opportunity then to witness, uh, to share the gospel, and to pray for people. 
to be honest, we've seen many people touched by the power of God in one way or another, with miracles of healing, salvation. Now, one of the main leaders, he wanted to come out with me. And obviously, being an atheist, I thought, oh, that's going to be a bit uh, interesting. So, he was walking around with us, and a guy who I prayed for the week before, uh, he got problems with his stomach, ulcers or something. God actually healed him. And um, he saw me walking around the corner with this, with this guy and he shouted me, thanking me that God had healed him and thankful for praying for him. Well, this leader heard this, pulled me to one side and he said, listen, he says, you can't go around doing that type of stuff. He says, we're not a religious group. He says, and we can't be seen to be doing this. I said, okay, fair enough. So after the night ended, we went home, we prayed, and asked God to make a way for us, uh, if it was his will, to continue in doing this. The following week, the same leader came up to me and he said, listen, Friday nights are yours. He says, you can do whatever you want to do on that night. He said, but just don't tell me. He says, I do not want to know what you do. I went, brilliant. I was like, I was, praise God. I was like, fantastic. So we continued doing this outreach every Friday night, no matter what the weather was, uh, for some years after. Going, seriously going into some of the darkest places. Um, it's quite scary sometimes for the women. Bringing light and hope, as Graham said this morning, uh, uh, and provisions to many into these dark situations. But seeing God glorified was the main thing for us. And I'm not gonna lie, it was messy sometimes. Actually, it was messy a lot, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't easy by any means, but God gave us the grace uh, to do this. He gave us the strength and he gave us the provisions. So many people we came across were very supportive uh, in what we were doing. And yes, there were times when people did look down on us, being verbally abused, threatened, swore at. I even had somebody try to threaten to kill me. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, I remember uh, some people coming out of the pubs and saying, why are you even doing this? They don't deserve this. Now remember those words, they don't deserve this. Yeah. So I'd turn around and I'd say, maybe not. But if you were out there on the streets, if you was in that doorway, I'd do the same for you. It wasn't always like this. But this is what we were called to do to go out. Even if we class this as being persecuted, we can either let the spirit of fear overtake us or go out in the love of God, knowing who we are in him, the son of God. Never once did we do this for ourselves. If we thought this way, we would never have done it in the first place. You see, it's not that we would be recognized. It's so that God would be recognized and glorified. In my whole life, I must add, before I was saved, I'm ashamed to say that I used to walk <coughs> past these guys in the streets to try and avoid them. I wanted nothing to do with them at all, not giving them even the time of day. That was where my heart was. But God, he soon dealt with that. I would end up actually sitting in the doorways with these guys. I'd listen to the stories, sharing with them, praying with them, holding them, literally having the tears, sorry, and snot all over me. You see, we have not been saved to stay the same. We've been saved for a reason. That's so that we could be changed and God would be glorified. I was that Barabbas, the son of the devil, before I met with Jesus. Then when I did, I became the son of God. It was some of the best times we had while we were doing this, admittingly. We grew up very quickly. It was raw, feeling every emotion possible, sometimes sad, happy, let down, hurt, tired, vulnerable, angry and frustrated. But this is how we chose at that time to serve God. We're all called to serve. Jesus also came to serve, not to be served. So let's just try to imagine as we move on 
how Jesus may have felt with what was going, what, what he was going through. All he was, although he was God in the flesh, he became a man. He also has feelings and emotions, the same as us. He'd been arrested, wrongly accused, spat upon, whipped. So if anybody had a right to be angry, I believe, it'd be Jesus. And to be honest, he was probably more grieved by their hardness of hearts. Just like today, people have and still do accuse God for many things. They mock him. They use his name in vain. They ridicule him. But why? Because they get offended at his truth. They get offended at his name. They get offended at his word. They get offended at his lifestyle. So don't you think that God would have been angry? I would say, more than likely, yeah. I mean, wouldn't you be angry if all these things were happening to you? Romans 1, 8, Romans 1 verse 18 tells us that, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. This actually used to be me. Ungodly, unrighteous, suppress the truth, doing things that I shouldn't have done. I didn't have God in my life at all. And I did not acknowledge God for who he is. He wasn't even in my thoughts. And I didn't even know that I needed saving. I have given God every reason in the book to be angry at me and with me. So based on Romans 1, if anyone has a right to be angry, I believe it's God and me. Yet God is patient. God is gracious. God is slow to anger and compassionate. We see here in Mark what we've read that Jesus takes the place of Barabbas and sets him free. This being the most important point we're here about to see. The scene was set. They had already bribed one of the apostles, Judas, with 30 pieces of silver to lead them to Jesus, which then went on to the arrest of Jesus, bringing him before Pilate to be questioned. This trial was no ordinary trial. It was planned. Verse 10, it shows us that they had already set out to want to kill Jesus. But why? Because they were envious of him. It tells us that. All of this was happening very early in the morning. So it was like it was being rushed through. Verse 1 reads, Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a meeting with the elders, the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him to Pilate, who were hoping for Pilate to accuse Jesus because these religious leaders did not have the authority to put a man to death. And for Pilate to basically put his stamp, his seal of approval on his permission, if you like, to put Jesus to death. Pilate asked Jesus, he says, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answers, it is as you say. In other words, what you say is correct. What you have said is truth. Jesus is basically saying, yes, I am king of the Jews, just by agreeing with Pilate. Jesus said very little, only replying to the questions which were truthful about him. With Pilate saying in so many words, look, Jesus, here's the deal, yeah? There's all these accusations being spoken against you that these chief priests are bringing to me. They're testifying against you, and yet you are silent. These religious zealots also accuse Jesus of many other things, which were false. Doesn't seem right, does it? It seems like Jesus already knew something. It's like he knew what was going to happen, and yet he stayed calm and peaceful. Point one, do you think that all of this, as we said earlier, was God's plan? Let's see. Mark 10, verse 33 to 34, Jesus said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him, scourge him, spit on him, 
and kill him. And the third day he will, he will rise again. So we see that Jesus had even told his disciples what was going to happen to him. And so we are seeing that this was God's plan. Jesus knew it and he was being obedient to the Father. If this, if this was us, do you think that we would, we would have stayed as calm as Jesus? Probably not. Would we have done what Jesus did in obedience to God? More than likely not. In John chapter 19 verse 11, Pilate says to Jesus, You're not speaking to me. Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Here we see God's power, authority, control and plan over what is actually happening and what is about to happen by using the evil of man. <clears throat> Pilate seemed bewildered and amazed as to why Jesus was not even trying to defend himself. I'm sure if it was us, we, we'd probably be shouting and screaming, saying they're lying, pleading our innocence or asking for a solicitor to come and defend us. But we hear the silence of Jesus, which seems to be more louder and powerful then we can actually hear his words. We learn here that a few words of truth can actually speak more powerful than many words spoken in anger. Also, our actions and our lives can speak louder than words. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers. So he opened not his mouth. This actually was a prophecy of about 600 years before even Christ was born. We are seeing here that scripture is revealing scripture. The New Testament is like a mirror image of the Old Testament. And we actually see scripture being played out and fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ in the events that we are, we are seeing. So based on what we've just heard, this is God's plan all along, playing out before our very eyes, even planned many hundreds of years before Christ was born. It's part of God's plan, you see, for the redemption of man, for the redemption of you and me. As we read the Bible, we should do so, being in awe of it, with the reverence that it truly deserves as being the truth of God's word, believing it, walking it out and living in its truth. This shouldn't stop us from asking questions. It's, it's actually healthy to ask questions. But let our lives be a living testimony. Let the way that we live and conduct ourselves in this world with Christ in us, being led by the Holy Spirit being in obedience to God, be the testimony of our faith and truth in our defence. I know we're not perfect, and yet there's always someone who wants to blame us for something. That's fine, but at least let them try to blame us for speaking and living this truth. As we're now more towards the end times, the world we live in seems today to be more evil wicked and hardened against the true Jesus, the true God. We as Christians should not be surprised at this if we do care to read our Bibles. With that said, Jesus being the rock and the stone that many stumble upon, they also reject him, try to kill him time and time again because of the message that he brings. <coughs> It's like it brings a new set of rules to the way that they've even been living. But in reality, it's how God wanted them to live in the first place. But they rejected him and lived their own way, just like I used to. And just like many people in the world today do. Matthew 2 shows us that even shortly after the birth of Christ, 
Herod wanted to kill him. Even his own people wanted to kill him. So we see Jesus as being someone who people see as a threat or an offence to them. Many will want to try and to remove the truth from you and try to get you into believing a false Jesus in a false message. This is the devil's plan and, and trying to deceive you into wanting you to believe that Jesus is not the only way, that he's not God. He didn't die on a cross for our sins and he was just a prophet, nothing else. Many church ministers, pastors and church councils becoming more fearful in this day than of God. By altering scripture with what scripture actually means, by making the Bible acceptable and palatable to the world, by changing doctrine in case it offends people. Instead of allowing the scriptures to change us. The Bible says is an offence to those who does not believe. Just as it was to me. More likely to, to you also. When you didn't believe. Isn't this what the people were offended by in the first place with Jesus speaking this truth? Pilate could clearly see that Jesus had done no wrong. He said to the crowd, he says, what evil has Jesus done? When in fact it should have been turned around onto the religious leaders because of their lies, of their deceitfulness. Maybe there should have been a trial for the trial. Maybe not. After all, they were the ones who gave Judas 30 pieces of silver, blood money, for the betrayal of Jesus. Let's not forget who Judas was, yeah? He was an apostle, one who walked closely with Jesus. He was in charge of the money bag, a man who held the position of truth. Yet he sold out Jesus to these people for money. I wonder how close Judas' heart really was to Christ as opposed to how close his heart was to money. We may ask the same question of ourselves as something to ponder on. Let's move on. So do we think that Jesus was, was guilty? Let's see. It was the time of the feast and the tradition was that one prisoner should be released and set free, probably to show the crowd how compassionate the rulers and leaders were by trying to keep in good stead with the people. Pilate then asked the crowd, he says, who do you want me to release to you? Jesus, the king of the Jews, or Barabbas? And with the crowd shouting all the more, crucify him. It seemed the more Pilate was asking the crowd who we should release, the more it stirred up the hearts of the people to condemn Jesus to death. All along, Pilate sees the innocence of Jesus and wants to release him. But he also wants to please the people. This shows us the very hatred that people had for Jesus. There's no difference between their hearts back then to the hearts of today. It is the evil within the heart of a man. And so because of this, we're in, we are in need of a new heart. It needs regenerating, reviving, renewing. So do our minds. And this can only happen with Jesus. By the Holy Spirit and reading God's word. In John 18, verse 38, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? It's like he didn't even know what truth was anymore. So after Pilate says this, he goes out to the people in fear that they may rebel against him. And so he said to the Jews, I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom, a tradition, that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out saying, no, not this man, but Barabbas. It's like, they seem to have more in common with a criminal than with Jesus. And Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, whipped him. This seemed to please the people even more. 
But we ask, why Jesus and not Barabbas? Why wasn't it Barabbas who was put on the cross, the criminal? Let's just, let's just see for a moment what the name of Barabbas actually means. It means the son of the father. Jesus also being the son of the father. So we actually see two parallels here with being a son. Yet one, he was a thief and he was a murderer who was condemned to death. He was the son of the devil. And the other, well, he fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He set people free. He raised the dead and spoke truth. So we can see by this that Jesus really isn't guilty. However, the religious leaders hated him. Why? Because of the claims that he had made, the deeds that he had done. He was a threat to the religious system and to their way of life for the lack of respect that, that they thought that he, had, that he had for their religious traditions and with the people that he associated with. Basically, they were offended at Jesus. But what we're about to see happen is, is an exchange. It's the greatest exchange ever to happen. Jesus, the Son of God, God in the form of flesh, replacing a murderer, a criminal. But let's also remember God's commandments. You shall not steal. You shall not commit murder. Even though Barabbas had committed all these things, God used the worst of sinners to exchange with. Only God can do this. Only God can, can forgive the sins that we have committed. Only Jesus going to the cross can have this power to not only forgive, but to remove the sins that we have committed, past, present and future. By his blood, a legal transaction has been made in heaven for us, here on earth. Just like Barabbas, the guilty as charged, which is, which is us, have been set free by the innocent one, which is Jesus, by becoming condemned to death on the cross. We ultimately see God extending his hand of grace towards us. And his, his agape love being offered to you by this exchange with Jesus receiving the full wrath of God, which he didn't deserve, being the very same wrath that we truly do deserve. So Barabbas, us, receive a full pardon. That doesn't seem fair, does it? But that's God's love. That's God's agape love. That's how his love works for you and for me. The very question I asked in the beginning, are we deserving of God's wrath? Yes. We have all sinned, as it says in Romans 3.23. However, out of God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, his wrath was poured out upon his son in exchange for you and for me. And Jesus drank from the very cup that you do not have to drink from. In Luke 22, Jesus asked God, if you are willing to remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Let me ask you, have you ever asked God to remove something from your life? Maybe an illness, a pain, a struggle, or something else, but he hasn't. Paul asked, Paul asked three times to remove this thorn from his side. God didn't, but it truly kept him humble and relying more on God. But what did God say? He said, my grace is sufficient. Job afflicted with much pain, suffering and loss. I believe it truly kept him humble for the rest of his life, relying more on God. Again, we see God's grace is sufficient. Jesus asked for this cup to be removed. But it wasn't. Do you draw near to God in your sufferings? Does this humble you for the need to rely more on God and press into God for his strength? There is what seems to be a greater purpose for our suffering 
although we may not see it at the time, but it truly keeps us humble and more reliant on God, or at least it should. And yet, many have been taught this, that this isn't God's will, and we shouldn't pray like, oh God, not my will, but your will, as if it's a weak prayer. It's a weak prayer of unbelief, that's some people say. Did Jesus pray in unbelief? When he said, not my will, but your will be done. No. It was to say that if, if I have to go through this, if this is going to be painful, so be it. As long as it is your will. But for any of us to suffer to go through stuff can surely learn us to rely more on God, hoping for a greater outcome. But it surely doesn't please us to go through stuff, does it? But let's not forget. God is a God of miracles. God can do the miraculous. God can turn situations around. However, in this instance, it actually pleased God for Jesus to go through what he did. Isaiah 53 verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put into grief when you make his soul an offering of sin. He gave everything for you and for me, for us. Jesus was the innocent, spotless lamb, led like a lamb to the slaughter for the exchange of our sins for God's wrath, which meant, it meant for us, and with God's love and mercy, that all of our guilt, shame and sins would be like actually laid upon Christ himself. You see, he did something that Barabbas, or even us, could never do. That's why he went to the cross in our place, for you and for me, to make us right before God. Jesus said, you rightly say, I am king. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. We've been justified with God through what Jesus has done on the cross. So we will become right standing before God, but in Christ only, and of no works of our own. Do you believe on him today? Have you exchanged your own life for the newness of life in Christ? If not, why not? What are you waiting for? Tomorrow isn't even promised. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time before Christ returns. Please do not put off until tomorrow what can be done today. Tomorrow never comes. We do not even know what's going to happen tomorrow, next week or even next year. I believe that God is calling his people. He's calling his people back to him. In the truth of Jesus and in the true message of the Gospels. Not in an entertaining message. You will know when this true message is preached. At times people may get offended. We may feel challenged and be a little bit uncomfortable. I believe I believe God has as He's been raising up ministers of truth to preach this true message of the gospels, not for twitching ears. We're not to come to church to be entertained. Please hear me out with this one. We come to church to want to learn to grow, to be strengthened, to fellowship, to become more mature, to know truth, to love the way that God wants us to love and to go out. If we keep being entertained, our hearts will become hard. Our hearts will become dull against the true message of God when we actually do hear it. A.W. Tozer wrote, we cannot afford to let down our Christian standards just to hold to the interest of people who want to go to hell and still belong to a church. Strong words, but true words. We are not a perfect church. We don't profess to be a perfect church by far. But we place value on it. Graham places value on what's been spoken here. As challenging as it is, and may seem sometimes, 
There is no compromise or entertaining gospel here at Oak City Church. Time is short, my friends. The return of Christ is nearer now than ever. We have a responsibility to all that come here so that your blood is not on our hands. Finally, we may ask, what should we do? What does this mean for us? Well, there is some good news today, and here it is. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And with him going to the cross in our place, we actually exchange our old life for a new life in Christ and our evil hearts of stone, for a new heart of flesh, being forgiven, we've been set free, made right with God, and can stand on the very rock of Christ and not stumble. You see, just like Barabbas, our identity changes from what many have been so blind to, a son of God, a daughter of God, so you can walk in freedom as a child of God. Therefore, as scripture tells us, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. This is a promise from God by way of the cross, through all that Jesus has done for you, to all who accept him, and, and to want to accept him, and want to come back to him, and to serve him. God is stretching out his hand to you, to accept and to receive his grace, his mercy and his forgiveness. Are you hearing his word today? May I ask the worship team please to come? If you found yourself letting go of God's hand, has your heart grown cold? It's like you feel you've been drifting away and that, that void, that gap has become wider and wider and you really don't know how to come back to him. The truth be known, it's like you even thought that, that God doesn't want you back because of certain things that have happened and that's a lie. It's truly a lie from the pit of hell. Have you been having signs of his calling? For you to come back to him. Are you hearing his voice today? You know who you are and so does God. What are you waiting for? Please do not leave it until it's too late. As Graham said in the beginning, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you. That he gave his one and only begotten son for you. So that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life, please reach out to him. Grab hold of God's hand today. Repent and start walking with God again. Come to the cross. Lay everything at his feet. I'm going to leave you with these words of Jesus from John 8, 31. He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He gave his life for you, to give you life. We are Barabbas. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we have just read that Jesus took our place on the cross, he set us free. We pray that our hearts will be stirred and moved this morning now, that we would be able to see more clearly and recognise who we are in you. Called by you as sons and daughters, set free, just as Barabbas was, that we may walk in the freedom given to us by God and that you would show us where we are to serve you, where you want us to be, would show us what we need to lay down first. If there's anything keeping us in chains, we pray May, they ch may those chains be broken. If we've been living far from the Lord, bring us nearer to your, by your spirit and truth to you. May we bring everything to you and lay it down at the cross and ask you for direction and that you would show us 
the way, the truth and the life that we should live to bring glory to you. In the name of Jesus we pray.